Okay, so we're going to do some more of the police report here um, about Preston Lord's murder, brutal murder, and beating death of a 16-year-old uh, honor student, three-time sports athlete, um, and this was done by the Gilbert, what was known as the Gilbert Goons. Hey, manager, you know anything about this stuff? Um, over there, you know, I have a good friend of mine from childhood that moved to Gilbert. I think it, wait, is it Gilbert? It's with a G. I'm, I might be the other, um, yeah, I think it is Gilbert. I don't want to think of Blaine Cove, that's Long Island. I have to check it out. I think it is Gilbert where she is. But anyway, the Gilbert Goons is made up, was made up of a bunch of entitled teenagers who just like to sport brass knuckles and things like that to go beat people up for no reason at all just to mess with them um just for something to do and they really uh did not know preston lord at all they had it's just uh, an unfortunate thing you know in the wrong place at the wrong time and he his friend had his necklace ripped off of his neck they were running from them they got him and they just they beat him till he had no brain activity left. A uh, 16 year old kid just snuffed out. And then beyond that, the parents of these teenagers, some of them used every resource they had to squirrel them away while their wounds healed on their hands um, and to help them evade any kind of prosecution for any of the things they did. And then this police report is full of, you know, from the subpoenas to Snapchat, uh, text messages, just showing the involvement from these people and uh, these kids, what they did, you know, saying things like, oh, that kid can't have a open casket because of what I did and I don't know my own strength and um, just horrible things like that, okay? So it's really important, it's an important case because this didn't just begin and end here. They were found to have beat up other people in an In-N-Out Burger and in a supermarket parking lot. And they had a lot of plans just to go out and hurt people, kill people for no reason. So they were on... Besides, uh, you know, whatever, alcohol or drugs, they were taking testosterone, some of them, allegedly. And, uh, you know, we're talking about, like, some roid rage stuff, okay? But that doesn't excuse them. The One of their fathers had owned, like, many gyms in the area and was supposedly very wealthy. And his ex-girlfriend is speaking out about how he tried to hide his son. And then we have, you know, other people speaking out about anger issues with these kids and lots of things that were going on. So this police report is shedding a lot of light on that. It's going to continue to. It's 1,162 pages, and we're only on um, 400 or so. So hi, Mr. Electric. How are you? And let's go ahead and keep going through this. We'll see if, um, let me see, where's my thing? Here we go. So here's where we left off yesterday. Um, let's see, I think we were about, right here we're talking about Gage. Seven, seven so far have been arrested. Let's see. And, um, charged with uh, murder. So we're going to see what happens. I think we were right. Over here, this was a, some of the redacted stuff, like you're not sure of who they're, this was all about D money. Okay, so let's, I think we were right here. When asked if he saw or had any videos from that night, 
The witness stated that he was in a group chat called Social Studies, and Taylor Sherman sent a video of Preston Lord getting dragged, a video already obtained by police. He stated that Taylor sent the video in the moment as it was happening. The witness stated he did not know if there was further talk or videos because he didn't check the snap messages, and the next day everything was deleted and people were leaving the group. When asked what he heard about the assault, the witness stated that he had messages Jake Meisner on Snapchat asking him what had happened, and Jake Meisner told him that Talon Renner was the one who punched him, meaning, I'm sure they mean Preston. The witness stated that the messages were no longer available as they delete automatically. The witness then mentioned that about two weeks ago, he was at a small get-together, and Mason Jostin was there, and so was his unredacted name. Mason Jostin confronted someone for snitching on him, and then Mason told someone that he had killed someone and that he did not want to be the next one. The witness then provided the following information, some Snapchat handles for the names provided, refer to the Detective Worsko supplement. Second interview with the person, I came into contact with a witness, his father, Robert, who advised that he had provided him with additional information involving going to someone's house the night of the incident. Robert advised that his child had also admitted to him that Gage was in fact dressed up in a suit style costume on the day of the incident, although she had said he was not during the first interview. Robert advised that his daughter described Gage to be wearing a black vest, black pants. I asked Robert if we could schedule the day so I could speak with his daughter again to get further as to why she was not completely honest in our first conversation. On 11-29, at approximately 1,500 hours, I met with the daughter and her father, Robert, at their residence. And this is a summary. The daughter said she picked up Gage, got gas, and went to a house. She said that they were only there for a few minutes, it felt like, and she spent her time in the kitchen. She stated that boys were hanging out in the garage and they were taking pictures of their costumes. She said she was made aware of them taking photographs because Treston had posted some of the photos on social media. The daughter stated that she was with a couple of girls while at the house who she knew from middle school. And once they left, they asked the daughter if he could catch a ride with her and Gage, and the daughter agreed. The daughter said they went to the ALA party in Queen Creek, and she met up with her friends and said Gage was with her during the majority of the time. The daughter said Gage's friends were seen talking to a subject known as D-Money near the corner of the backyard. The daughter said Gage's friends were a redacted person's name, Mason, Justin, Jake Meisner, D Money, Tristan Billy, someone else redacted, Talon Renner, and possibly another male. The daughter says she does not know Talon very well, but they went to school together freshman year and she knows of him. The daughter said that she knows the guys from previously hanging out with them with Gage. The daughter also mentioned a female by the name of Redacted and a second one who she spoke to while at the ALA party. I asked this daughter what females were at the house, and she said she was talking to Caroline and two other girls that were there that she did not personally know. Per the daughter, the two other females were Caroline's friends. I asked her why she initially said that Gage was not wearing a costume, and she said she forgot. Um, the daughter said she was speaking with someone, and she remembered that Gage was wearing the daughter was unsure why Gage lied to me when I spoke to him as well. The daughter described Gage's costume to be a cheap material suit style vest, black with a bow tie, with a red bow. And she said that Gage was also wearing a white circular hat and that all the boys were wearing the same type of costumes, minus Treston, who was wearing white. The daughter said Talon did not participate with dressing up while at that house. She said he might have gone home to put on a costume and it was unknown what it was. Oh my gosh. Oh, 
Hold on one second. Let me see something. One second. That scared me so much waiting for uh, medical results and that was they're like my doctor and then I listening and it was just a survey or something I don't know it was bizarre okay so anyway um, let me let me go on with this now so I um, that she might have gone and put on custom and I don't know I asked the daughter if she saw anyone drink alcohol while at the house and she said the only one she saw was a redacted person take a sip of something. The daughter said she believed Treston and someone else had ridden with someone who was driving his mother's white BMW X7. Someone rode with Mason who was driving a gray Nissan truck and, and the daughter said that Luke rode with her after leaving the house. The daughter said she did not pick up anyone else and drive to the ALO party where they all hung out in the same area in the backyard of the party. I asked the daughter if she saw anyone fight or anyone starting issues. She recalled Treston shoulder checking someone when they walked in, unknown who. The daughter did not see any other issues while at the ALA party, and once they left, she followed Mason and walked at the second and, and parked at the second party. You guys can still hear me, right? I was nervous about my mic because sometimes when I unmute after I've muted, people can't hear me. Just put a one if you can still hear me. That would be great. Okay. She said she showed up shortly after they all walked towards the party together, but that was when the police officer drove past her and told her she looked miserable. The daughter said she was cold, and so Gage had walked back to her vehicle to get Gage's sweatpants on. The daughter and Gage began walking towards the party as the rest of the guys had already gone inside. She said her and Gage entered the garage at first but didn't see any of their friends. Thank you, Kate. Um, the daughter said she then walked to the backyard and they saw several groups of people and the guys. And then she said she was sitting on a rail in the backyard when she saw some kid putting his cell phone in people's faces and saying things. And at that time, Tristan told the guy, put the phone down. Then she said a black guy started to get mad because of the person recording them and told them to put their phone down. I asked her who was recording. According to her, she said she was told someone was recording the group, but she did not physically see who it was. I asked if she knew who the black guy was, and she was unsure, but described him to be black and have dreads. The daughter said shortly after the kids started running from the backyard to the front of the residence, and so she began to run as well. The daughter said as she was running out, kids were still in the garage, but she ended up behind the group and ran to her vehicle where she met up with Gage. She said someone then went to her vehicle and asked for his belongings, which he grabbed from her vehicle and left. I asked the daughter if Gage mentioned anything about being in a fight or being assaulted, and she said no. The daughter said that they went back to Gage's house, where they stayed for the remainder of the night, and I asked the daughter if she saw any fights while running to her vehicle. She said no. I thanked her for her time and ended our conversation. Interview with another redacted person at 1130. Detective Worsko and I met with someone at Queens Creek High School, for an interview. The interview took place in the principal's office and the witness's father was present. Detective Worsko and I introduced ourselves to the witness's father, David Garcia, who appeared upset to be meeting with us. Detective Worsko explained that he wanted to speak with the witness in reference to the incident involving Preston Lord, as information was obtained that their child was at the party. David questioned the detective why we wanted to speak to their child as there were several kids at the party. It was explained 
that as the investigation is ongoing, several interviews have been conducted in reference to any identified subjects who attended the party. David asked what specific information detectives were looking for out of their child, and again, it was explained that they wanted to obtain any information of anything he witnessed that night at the incident. Detective Worsko mentioned a video surveillance clip that showed their son, his son, at the party and wanted confirmation that it was him. David was upset and asked how we have none of the subjects involved been caught. David continued to question detectives after being explained the process of the investigation. David advised he had a bad experience with police involving his son and this is why he was hesitant about his son saying anything, thinking it would be turned around on him. David said his son would only answer questions in relation to the party and was restrictive on what he wanted detectives to ask. The son stated he was at the party for about 45 minutes and left prior to the incident. The son said there were several people at the property and he was with his friend. He also confirmed he was there with his friend. The son said he met up with his friend from Combe High School while inside the garage, which included five other people and possibly a kid named something else. He called them the Combs Group and they all attended Combs High School and was where they all met. The son said he was mainly with someone during the party. Detective Worsko asked the son if he was wearing all black the night of the incident. He said, yeah, wait, I don't remember to be honest. The son said he was approached by his friends to exclude someone earlier in the night. When asked if the son had seen any confrontation or fights while at the party, he mentioned two black kids arguing in the backyard. I asked the son if he ever saw someone um, he confirmed earlier in the night that he had seen him at one of the other fr at one of their friends something truck, but not after. The son stated that it was not usual to see someone's group of friends at that party as they are not known to attend high school parties. I asked that son if he recalled anything about the incident involving two black kids in the backyard. The son said he remembered seeing the Combs group standing behind one of the black kids who was facing the second black kid. The son described the interaction between the two black males to be confrontational and like they were talking shite to each other. During this, he said he was unsure why the Combs group was standing behind one of the males involved in the argument. The son said he was unable to provide further and stated he did not witness the assault. We ended our conversation and he returned to class. Okay, this is uh, Joanna Uribe. And uh, let's see what this is. This is Frank Grossman. My body-worn camera was active. The residence, okay, this was, I was advised by CIU, Crime Investigation Unit, had obtained a search warrant for somewhere, and I was deployed, okay, because they kept going in with the full armored um, vehicles and the full SWAT every time they had these search warrants. The residents were contacted. They exited the residence willingly. I approached the front door to the residence. I made announcements. I told them we were serving a search warrant and that anyone remaining in the residence had to exit. Myself and other SWAT operators searched the residence for, residence for additional inv individuals and advised CIU personnel the residence was secure. The residents were escorted back into the residence and assisted in moving the dogs into a bathroom that had already um, been searched. The backyard was then searched and the residence was turned over to CIU for their detailed search. SWAT left the area. On Monday 11-6, I was advised CIU had obtained search warrants for the following addresses. Okay, so they keep doing the same thing. They take everybody out. The armored van and the bear cat were driven to the residence and the residents were contacted by phone. Two juvenile males were within the residence and secured a large dog within a bathroom. The juvenile males then exited the residence and they were checked by SWAT officers for weapons and then they were turned over to the CIU detectives. 
SWAT officers approached the front door, announced our presence, serving a search warrant, and that anyone remaining had to exit the residence. SWAT served the residence for additional individuals, searched the residence for additional individuals and advised CIU when the residence was secure. The adult female resident had arrived on scene and was escorted inside, where she was assisted in moving the dog to a secured location in the backyard. Once the bathroom where the dog had been secured was checked, the residence was turned over to CIU for their detailed search and SWAT left the area. The armored van was driven to another address and again, there they did another search warrant. Same, same kind of thing, okay? People coming out, the dogs secured in the backyard. And let's see what they're finding here. So that's three different um, searches. Now we have Denton Schneider on 11:29, approximately 139 hours. I was dispatched a call for service in reference to following up with this investigation. I contacted Riley Wybron, identified to me verbally. Riley informed me that while on a FaceTime chat call with her friends, with benefits partner, identified as Joey La, La Liberty, Riley received this information. Riley informed me that Joey was intoxicated when he told her this, and she felt the need to tell police because she has a child. And if she were in the Lord's family position and somebody knew something, she'd want the police to be notified. Riley provided me with the social media handles of Joey that she has for Instagram and Snapchat. Snapchat. Riley stated that she was nervous about providing this information because she didn't want Joey knowing that she spoke to the police. Riley also provided me with Joey's cell phone number. Okay, so Jamie Stalter responded to an SAU. Okay, upon arrival, I seated. I was seated in the passenger seat of a fully marked Queens Creek PD Bear Bearcat armored vehicle. Tactile medic Harper parked the vehicle in the driveway of the residence blocking two vehicles in the driveway and facing the front door. Upon receiving confirmation from the tactile commander that the TAC team was set, I initiated attempts at communicating with the subject of the search warrant, Dominic Turner. This is D-Money. At approximately 1708 hours, I activated the emergency lights and the howler siren on the armored vehicle. You might have seen um, footage of this. Hi, Debbie L. At approximately 1709 hours, I contacted Dominic Turner via phone. Dominic answered the phone and I identified myself as a Queen Creek police officer. I advised that we're outside the residence and needed to serve a search warrant. I asked Dominic if he would exit the residence and speak with officers and he said he would. While speaking with Dominic, he was also speaking with another person inside the structure, asking them to secure their dogs. I then gave instructions for Dominic to exit the residence through the front door with his hands raised, empty and visible to officers. I directed him to follow the commands of the officers outside once he exited. Dominic exited the residence with his hands raised and visible and his cell phone in his right hand. Dominic complied with officers' commands upon exiting. At approximately 1711 hours, I made an announcement on the Bearcats PA system for the remaining occupants of the residence to exit through the front door with their hands raised and empty. At approximately 1712 hours, a female exited the residence and complied with the officer's commands. And this concludes my involvement. Then uh, Joanna Uribe, again, this item has, um, this is authorizing the release something to Rebecca Renner, the mother of, this is uh, Talon Renner, this item has been deemed not to be evidentiary in value as it belongs to someone I authorized the release to Brittany Detheridge, mother of Talon Vigil. This item has been determined to be school property and not deemed to be of evidentiary value, something they took during a search warrant. Okay, this is uh, an interview with Gage Garrison Silas by Johanna Eribe. 
The following is a summary of Gage's interview with me and Detective Shipman, which was conducted at his residence and were invited into this home as Gage preferred the interview to be conducted there. Gage was occupied by his mother. I think they don't mean occupied, they mean accompanied. Um, by his mother, Diana Garrison. The following is paraphrased, is not verbatim. Should be noted that Gage did not provide all the details initially because he was scared. However, he added more details as the interview continued. And there's BWC footage. Gage was picked up by his girlfriend in her BMW and they went to a residence at about 20, 45 hours. After something residence, he, someone and someone, went to the first party at Via D. Arboles, and they were there for 20, 25 minutes. Gage provided the following subjects were at the party. Jake Meisner, Tristan Billy, two people that are not identified there, Mason Justin, Talon Renner, Owen Hines, Taylor Sherman, and two others that they have redacted. Gage provided descriptions, which were for the most part consistent with what the investigation had confirmed. 194th Street party, Gage describes Heisner room over the residence as being big and having about 30 plus people in the RV garage and additional in the backyard. While in the backyard, he notices two black kids arguing, but he's unable to hear what the argument's about. A large group surrounds the two black kids, and he is unable to see what is going on. Gage tries to elevate himself by getting on some sort of pillar, but he isn't able to provide any further details of the argument. Gage and someone else decide they want to leave, and his group of friends also begins to leave. As they're walking past the garage to the roadway, Gage recalls someone from his friend group talking about someone's talking about taking someone's chain. Gage is unable to say who exactly was talking about the chain, and only that they were talking about taking a chain. As the group continues into the roadway, Gage says about halfway from the residence to E. Via del Rancho Road, he looks back and he sees that someone is still behind him and he pauses there for a moment to let her catch up. That must be his girlfriend, right? Once Gage turns around, he notices D. Money take the chain from an unknown subject. Gage then sees a subject hit someone. Gage says he notices a group fighting east of 194th Street on East Via del Rancho. Gage is unable to say who but stated that his friend group, which he listed at the beginning of the interview, was in the area. Gage says he walks to where the fight occurred, but by the time he gets there, everyone looked like they were just got done fighting. Gage said he saw someone on the ground as people were beginning to disperse, disperse which is uh, Preston Lord on the ground. Hi, Nan Sullivan. Gage said he saw subjects coming from the east, towards 194th Street around the same time. Gage said when he was only able to see Owen, someone, Treston, and Talon Renner near the group where the fight had just occurred, Gage was asked if there was anyone from his friend group he did not see in the area where the fight occurred, and he said he did not. Gage said he went to his vehicle where he met with his girlfriend and went home for the remainder of the night. It should be noted that Gage provided additional information to Detective Shipman. See his supplement. During our contact with Gage, we served a search warrant that was drafted by Detective Dana Eribe for physical seizure of his cell phone. I collected Gage's purple iPhone 14 and transported it to the station. The phone was entered into evidence. Gage did provide a signed consent for a forensic examination of his phone which will be done at 1130 and I emailed him a copy of the property receipt to the email provided to him. I provided a copy of the property receipt to Dana Eribe so she could return the search warrant. This is again Joanna Eribe. The cell phone was searched by hand by Detective Lines via consent. See his supplement. The following is information found during the cell phone examination that was conducted by hand by Detective lines. There was a text message between someone talking about the 10k reward money and discussing if Taylor 
should come forward. Taylor, I mean, everyone thinks Tresty is dumb for kicking him. Then let's do it. I honestly don't care if I have 10K on my head. There is a Snapchat screenshot where Taylor is talking to a Snapchat user listed as something redacted. The person is believed to be either Jacob or someone else who are associated with the vehicle Talon Vigil was driving the night of the incident about the 10K reward. It appears the messages between her and Taylor have been deleted in comparison with the text messages extracted during the forensic exam of Taylor's cell phone. This is an interview and phone pickup. The interview is a summary of my interview with another witness. Let's see here. On Friday, November 3rd, at approximately 1530, I completed an interview with a witness regarding a tip from Kenny Thorley, the Dean of Students at ALA Gilbert North. The tip stated that someone reported having a conversation with Talon Renner via Snapchat, where he told someone that I got in a fight, a big fight, and I accidentally killed a kid. I guess I don't know my own strength. For further information regarding that tip, refer to Officer Sandal, Sandoval. I mentioned to that person the reason we wish to speak with her today was based on a report that she may have had a conversation with Talon Renner regarding the incident involving Preston Lord's death on October 28th, confirmed that she did speak with Talon that night, and she said he reached out to her around midnight over Snapchat. She said there was no record of their conversation because Snapchat deletes the messages after 24 hours. The girl stated she was not at the Queen Creek party where Talon Lord was killed, excuse me, where Preston Lord was killed, but she attended another party in Queen Creek where Talon was also present. The girl showed Detective Arebi a screenshot of the event invite, which showed the information related to what had been referred to as the ALA party. The girl stated that she recently dated Talon for about two weeks, but broke up with him sometime in September. She said when she arrived at the ALA party around 2030 hours, she saw Talon there and decided to walk over and say hi. She said she only spoke with him for about five minutes before he walked away. She decided Talon, she described Talon wearing a longer black suit jacket with black pants and black shoes. I asked if he wore a hat at all and she said she not, did not think so. She was unable to describe anyone else Talon was with at the time and never got to know any of his friends when they were together. The girl stated Talon messaged her on Snapchat later that night after she got home around midnight and stated, I think I just killed a kid. She asked him what he was talking about and he mentioned that he kicked some kid and a lot of people were screaming. Talon stated that he left that he stated after he left, he drove back to the area and saw people outside crying and saying things like, he's gone, he's gone. The girl stated that Talon didn't say much else and later unfriended her the following day. The girl said that Talon attends ALA Gilbert North as well, but has not shown up to school since before the incident with Preston Lord. The girl stated that Talon messaged her from his Snapchat profile and she gave him the Snapchat profile. I later spoke with the girl on the phone and stated, I wish to confirm this statement originally provided to us via the tip line. The statement provided to QCPD indicated Talon stated to this girl, I got in a fight, a big fight, and I accidentally killed a kid. I guess I don't know my own strength. I asked the girl if that statement was accurate and if Talon stated those words to her and she stated that was what he said. On Tuesday, November 14th, I contacted the girl and her mother, Allison, at their residence and was provided with and was provided written consent to obtain the girl's cell phone for a forensic download of its contents. The phone was then transported to the Queen Creek evidence lockers as it awaited a digital forensic download. Okay, Michael Joust. Um, 
This is another search warrant at approximately 1700 hours. I parked my assigned detective vehicle of incident location at East Valentine Road at the Queen Creek Police Department Special Assignment Unit. SAU contacted all residents at the above listed address and I maintained my distance until I was advised it the rest the residence was cleared to approach. Dominic Turner was one of the occupants from the residence and he was directed to walk to my location where Detective Shipman and Detective Blount asked if he would be willing to speak with them. Dominic agreed to this. Please see Detective Shipman and Detective Blount's supplement. Detective Eribe, Lines and Workscow works con conducted the search of the property. Please see their supplements. All the search was after the search was completed, the homeowners were, were provided a receipt for the items collected and all detectives and I cleared the scene This is, um, okay, this is uh, Lori Spiker. Lori Spiker was in a long-term relationship with Travis Renner. Again, Travis Renner is Talon Renner's father. Lori Spiker is the ex-significant other of Travis Renner. And recently, they were no longer together. Lori Spiker had a previous relationship with Trevor Perry and had a son, Brigham Brigham Perry. Brigham Perry and Talon Renner grew up together. According to the tips, Talon Renner had communicated with Brigham Perry about the assault to Preston Lord and provided details about that assault. Brigham has since then told his mother, Lori, about this conversation. Lori appeared to have shared information regarding this conversation between Brigham Perry and Talon Renner to different people who called in the information to QCPD. Trevor Perry, and that's not Trevor Perry, that, right? Is it? Uh, yes, it is Trevor Perry. These names are so similar. Trevor and Travis. Wow. Trevor Perry and his wife, Camille Llewellyn, reported to QCPD that Trevor had a recorded conversation with Lori Spiker in which she explains what Brigham Perry had told her. And she was asking Trevor Perry to talk to Brigham and convince him to come forward to the police. It should be noted that Trevor Perry shared the audio file of the conversation between him and Lori to the QCPD and was uploaded into Axon Evidence. The following is bullet points of the information provided by the tips. Talon Renner's family had taken Talon Renner up to their home in Sholo, Arizona to allow his hands to heal. Talon Renner allegedly told Brigham Perry the following. Jake, believed to be Jacob Meisner, grabs and throws Preston Lord to the ground. Talon Renner straddled Preston Lord and had hammer punched Preston multiple times. Talon Renner kicked Preston. Once Talon Renner got up, Treston Billy kicked Preston and others began to hit Preston once on the ground. As information and interviews continued, I continually reviewed media uploaded into QCPD Axon and reviewing the information being obtained. It should be noted research was conducted on Travis Renner and a red burgundy Ford truck was identified as being registered to him. The vehicle was located on Flock, northbound in the area of Sholo, Arizona on 11-3-2023. The particular license plate reader camera is on US 60 NB at Sierra Pines Trail, 2.5 miles south of Sholo, Arizona. Someone, a.k.a. someone by, de by Detective D. Eribe and Detective M. Worsko supplements. The person has been named early on in a Snapchat post as being involved. During the interview, the person confirmed that he had attended a party on Via de Arboles, but did not attend the second party on 194th Street. He showed detectives his location application his application. 
On 1028, between 1953 and 2003 hours, his location shows him going from one place to the other uh, via D. Arbole's party. On 1028, between 2134 and 2149, his location shows him going from two places to the area of German Road and South Banning Drive. This area could be the area of a separate party going on that night. He stays in that area from 2149 on 1029 to, excuse me, from 2149 to 1029-0021 hours. And this is someone else, but Dr. Driscoll on 11-5-2023, someone came in accompanied by his parents for a formal interview. The, formal, the following are bullet points. Let's see about this one. As the group is following someone, they were singing, na, na, hey, goodbye song. Dom, that's D-Money, goes behind and grabs and snatches a chain from someone and keeps walking. Jake, Jacob Meisner, punches someone in the back of the head. Two seconds after Talon Renner walks behind someone and punches, and that's Preston Lord, falls forward. This person describes it's Preston as the kid in the blue jersey. Preston begins to go down and people are running down the road. Someone runs and returns. He remembers seeing Preston on the ground. He was later told Preston was kicked while he was on the ground. He waited by someone's car and when Gage and girlfriend returned, Gage said he wanted to be alone with his girlfriend. This person ended up getting into Mason Jostin's truck along with uh, two other people. They went to Mansell Carter or Aces Park and then to another party. While at that party, he asked Mason Jostin to take him home. However, Mason didn't want to leave yet. Someone else offered to take him home. He rode with them and Tristan Billy back to residence. On the way, they picked up Caroline and someone else the girls they were supposed to meet at the party sometime between the incident and getting to someone's house he noticed trust and billy look scared trust and billy tells him i don't know man i was the last one to kick him someone was told also told by owen william owen hines that he owen told them why are they kicking him in the head owen told the person i only kicked him in the stomach Someone also provided multiple photographs taken on 10-28-2023 while at a residence which shows the subjects in their costumes. I was able to confirm the following. Unk white male in a white tan hat with a black ribbon, a black suit with white pinstripes, a white undershirt, black shoes, and white stripes, and sunglasses. Tristan Billy had his black hat with a white ribbon. A white suit with pinstripes, a red tie, red flower, and black dress shoes, and a golden color large, large chain. Jacob Jake Meisner had a purple hat with a feather, blue jeans, gold black coat to his calves, and a white shirt under and unk shoes. Unknown shoes. Sorry. Unk shoes. Unknown. Okay. Black with white um, pinstripe. This is a person that they're not putting the name. So they black with white print stripe hat with a white ribbon, white short sleeves, black with white pinstripe vest, black with white pinstripe pants, and clear glasses. Then someone else that they have redacted as curly blonde hair with a blue suit jacket, a white undershirt, dark blue pants, and all white shoes. Another one is a brown hat, black short sleeve, brown vest, khaki pants, and all black tennis shoes. Another person, black hat, black long sleeves, black vest with a red handkerchief and a blue dress pants, black shoes, and a white sole. Another one is a black long sleeve, black pinstripe vest, black pants, all black shoes, and dark hair. Another has a black hat, black and white striped shirt, light gray vest, black pants, and black shoes. This description was not seen on video footage, it says. And then another one has a maroon long sleeve, gray vest, gray pants, black shoes, not seen on video footage. 
and then Dom has a black hooded sweater, black sweats, and black shoes. Okay, investigation day 10. On this day, multiple search warrants were served and executed based on the information investigation had revealed up to this point. The following is the information at this time, which led to the probable cause to obtain the search warrants. Talon Renner, Talon Renner's residence, Rebecca Renner. It should be noted, due to not being familiar with the e-warrant system, Rebecca Renner is listed as the person who committed the crime, which is incorrect. The clerical error was not discovered until after the search warrant was returned. The person who committed the crime should have been Talon Renner, Jacob Meisner. Jacob Meisner's residence, William Owen Hines and residence, and someone else's residence, and Mason Jostin. Investigation summary. The investigation revealed the following through interviews and evidence on scene. On 1028, public posts were disseminated via social media application Snapchat, indicating a Halloween party was to be held at a certain address. Numerous juveniles attended the party. Some in some posts indicated alcohol would be provided at the party. It was reported that there were approximately 100 to 200 juveniles attending the party. The party was reported to be in the backyard and inside the RV garage, while the homeowners, Roberto and Emily Carrera, remained inside the residence. During the party, a friend of someone's, identified as redacted, approached one male identified as a redacted to greet him as he knew him from the past. Sometime after, a subject identified as redacted confronted someone's reference and issue surrounding a rumor at school. And during this verbal disturbance between these two, a large group began to develop. A subject later identified as a redacted name who had arrived at the party with someone else had begun recording the verbal argument and was told to stop recording and delete the message. The person took the opportunity to leave the party and based on interviews is believed to have left the party at 2130 hours. Video surveillance recovered from the residence where the party occurred. Something shows a large group of students leave at about 2141. Someone and his friends began walking northbound on South 194th Street when another group of juveniles began shouting and chasing them on foot. A 14-year-old was with someone during this time when he was pushed to the ground, punched in the head, and ultimately sustained superficial abrasions and a broken wrist. Someone was also running with that person when he observed someone being shoved to the ground while Mrs. Preston Lord was on the ground this person observed 10 to 15 people standing over Preston, punching and kicking him. An interview with someone indicated a possible Asian male, big, wearing all white with a red tie, pulled the chain and punched someone on the right side of the face. The person received minor swelling to his right cheek and an abrasion to his right knee. The person stated he was able to recover his pendant. However, his imitation golden colored chain was not recovered. He valued it at $10. Someone was able to share the video he had taken of the verbal argument with a couple of people. In the video, you can observe who has been confirmed to be someone in a white tank. To top, white tank top black tie and a hat, a black male with a gold chain and a black dress shirt identified as redacted, a Hispanic or Asian in a white suit with pinstripes, a red tie, and who was later identified as Treston Billy, a white male with blonde hair in a black sweater who has not been identified. Following up, the investigation revealed Snapchat messages in reference to this incident were discovered. An unidentified juvenile sent screenshots of Snapchat messages between a username and another username communicating about the incident. The username is believed to be the Snapchat of someone else where he commented the following in a private Snapchat message. I hit a kid and this kid fell, hit his head, and then they kicked his head in the ground. And then I got word he died. 
So I don't know. As of 10-31, 2023, law enforcement continued to receive media evidence related to the Snapchat conversations between a person and an unknown account about the incident, including the following. The kid in the white suit kicked the kid's head in. Here, hold on, Talon Renner is the kid. Knocked him out before the kid in the white suit kicked him. The usernames that this person is communicating with are not visible. Upon getting multiple tips stating the male in the white suit with the red tie observed in the still shot that had been disseminated by an unknown person to the public was identified as Treston. It should be noted one of the still shots depicted Treston in the white suit, red tie, dark or black dress shoes, red rose or handkerchief in the left pocket, and a golden colored chain with a large golden colored pendant. On 1031, Treston Billy arrived at the station with his parents but ultimately ended up leaving. Treston was contacted and confirmed he had been at the station and he provided contact information. Investigators were able to positively identify Treston Billy via social media, Arizona identification, and citizens who had seen the still shot. On 11-1-2023, investigators interviewed an eyewitness to the incident, identified as someone redacted. They stated that he had been to the party at the party with Talon Vigil and the person provided a description for his and Talon's costume. He stated that he was wearing neon color shoes and stated, and the person is tall, white male with curly hair. Investigators were able to corroborate the witness's statement about him being there and positively identified someone in the video surveillance from the residence where the party occurred. The witness told investigators he saw a male in a white suit with a round face and a Mexican with a dark face kicked or stomped Preston as he was on the ground. Based on the above detailed information, it is believed that Treston Billy, 18 years of age, was involved in the physical assault against Preston the night of 1028 at about 2149 hours. It was also believed that Treston was involved in the assault against someone else by pushing him to the ground and punching him in the head and ultimately sustained superficial abrasions and a broken wrist on 1028 between 2145 and 2147 hours. It's also believed that Treston was involved in the assault against someone else by punching him and pulling his chain from that person's neck between the same time. The incident location near East V via Del Rancho on South 194th Street was processed and red stains consistent were located on the scene. DNA swabs were recovered on scene and clothing was also later recovered. A search warrant was served at Treston's residence. During the search warrant, the following was recovered from the residence. Treston's cell phone, a white pinstripe top with a red fabric flower, white pinstripe pants, two red ties, and black dress shoes. 11.3 to 11.5, the investigation continued. The following information has been obtained. Video surveillance between 2100 and 2210 hours. A residence where the party occurred, a residence that had the view of the intersection, 194th Street and East Via Del Rancho, where the assault is believed to have begun a residence northwest of the location and view of one of the two egress ingress for the incident location. An eyewitness interview of LO confirmed on video surveillance on on description. An eyewitness of GO juvenile confirmed on video surveillance on description. A witness interview of DO juvenile and a tip regarding an information from Lori Spiker, Talon father's ex and mother to Brigham Perry. Audio recording provided by Trevor Perry, Lori's ex and father to Brigham of Lori and Trevor talking about Talon's contact with Brigham. A video surveillance from Mansell Carter Oasis Park and a flock law enforcement license plate reader and a digital media provided as evidence. 
information provided is indicating of a group of friends who began their evening at a residence. Everyone was in costumes and they were going to Halloween parties. The subjects directly involved to the assault are described as Treston Billy, Talon Renner, William Owen Hines, and Jacob Jake Meisner. Treston Billy made a statement directly to law enforcement after the incident while inside of someone's white BMW. I was the last one to kick him. Treston Billy was described and confirmed to have been wearing a white pinstripe shirt, suit, red tie, red fabric flower, fake gold chain, and a large pendant and black dress shoes. William Owen Mines made a statement at the end of the night at someone's residence that he didn't know why they were kicking him in the head. William Owen Hines said, I only kicked him in the stomach. William Owen Hines was described and identified on video surveillance to be wearing a red cloak, long black sleeve khaki pants, and white shoes. An eyewitness saw Jacob Jake Meisner punching a subject matching a description, and another one, um, other information from tips stated Jacob might have helped hold Preston on the ground while Talon Renner hammer punched him while on the ground and kicked him in the head. Jacob Jake Meisner was described and identified on video surveillance as wearing a top hat with a feather, gold and purple cloak coat, and bluish pants. An eyewitness said Talon Renner walked to the right of someone and punched someone on the right side of their head. That person fell to the ground immediately and people began surrounding him. Talon Renner was described and identified on video surveillance as wearing a blue suit jacket with an undershirt, black pants, and white shoes. Information was after the assault, the group scattered. Per video surveillance, it's believed that at least Dresden Billy entered the SUV along with two other subjects. Another group got into a gray Nissan Frontier registered to Mason Jostin. The group included Mason Jostin and L.O. The two vehicles went to Mansell Carter Park and they went to an additional party and ultimately they all ended up at a residence. Information was provided that was a Snapchat group chat including all the subjects involved to Mason someone and someone. Information was provided that stepbrother to Talon Renner, identified as Brigham Perry, aka Briggs, had received a phone call from Talon the night of the incident where he said he had killed a kid. Brigham told his mother, Lori Spiker, ex to Travis Renner, Talon Renner's bio father, what Talon had said told Brigham. The information included was what Jacob Meisner threw and Talon Renner had hammer punched and kicked Preston while he was there on the ground. Lori also stated that Talon contacted her, making a statement the thing that things were effed up and he had killed a kid. Incident timeline and observations. On ten twenty eight at approximately eighteen twenty six hours. Someone in his friend group arrived at a different party. During the video surveillance, someone appears visibly well, and his friend group plus two additional sub subjects to include who is believed to be redacted based on physical and clothing. Between 2107 and 2155 hours, both groups involved are believed to be at the party located at a certain address there. A Snapchat video provided by someone which showed someone, Treston, and another white male engaged in some sort of interaction. And this is consistent with all witness information regarding a verbal argument against two people. At 2147, someone's group exits the garage to the residence and the other involved group exits from the south side of the garage. Someone's group walks towards the roadway and the other group follows. The subject in all white and black shoes and red accents identified as Treston along with another subject in a top hat with a feather and a purple gold coat appear to have to close distance between them and the others and the friends group. It should be noted that LO and GO were confirmed to have been near 
this group when they left the party based on descriptions provided by LO and GEO during interviews. The two groups continue northbound at 194th Street until they reach the intersection of 194th and East via Del Rancho Road, where the physical fight is believed to have begun based on the video and witness testimony. At about 2143 hours, running is observed in the intersection. The information is corroborated from a video surveillance from some area where, which is on um, the northeast corner of the intersection. Video camera pointed towards the west driveway and had a partial view of the north and northwest part of the intersection. At 2143, two subjects are seen running from the assault location and someone is seen near a bush looking towards an assault location consistent with his interview. It should be noted, FU is heard in the background just prior to the two subjects running northbound Shortly after the two subjects run northbound, a subject in an all-white suit and dark shoes, believed to be Treston, also runs away northwest, followed by six to eight subjects. In the footage, laughing is heard as they run away. What the F? And you hit that dude, is heard in the video. Yelling from possibly a female is heard in the background. In the video footage collected from a residence, which faces the road between 193rd and 194th Street, which is one of the two egress-ingress roads to the party. Footage shows a white SUV, later believed to be registered to Billy Lest and being driven by someone else based on flock and eyewitness information, arrives in parks on the north side of East Via Del Palo at about 2123 hours. Three subjects exit that vehicle. One subject is wearing all light colors, dark shoes, and has a consistent stride as seen on the video from something for Treston. At about 2137 hours, two subjects walk towards the vehicle. One appears to go to the driver's side of the vehicle momentarily, and then they both walk westbound. Shortly after, one of the subjects returns as the lights to the vehicle illuminate. The subject then walks eastbound a short distance and turns back towards the vehicle. At 2146 hours, the subject motions with his arm and appears to be looking back as if he was talking to someone. At about 2146 hours, a small truck consistent with a Nissan Frontier pulls up and the subject appears to make contact briefly. The subject then continues westbound. The truck is believed to be registered to Mason Drosten per flock and eyewitness information. At 2146 hours, two additional subjects walk from the east and walk up to the rear of the white SUV. Subject who was already standing by the vehicle walks from the driver's side and approaches the two subjects. One of the two subjects that came from the east was wearing an all light colored suit consistent with Treston's attire that night. As the two subjects are standing by the rear of the white SUV, the subject in the all light colored suit makes a kicking motion, followed by an up and down motion with his right foot consistent with his stump. At 2147 hours, the white SUV leaves westbound. Based on information provided by eyewitness LO, who stated that he was with the group when Treston earlier in the evening and after the incident, a search was conducted for a BMW 7 registered to a Billy Leist. A license plate was located for a white BMW. The vehicle matched the visual appearance of the white SUV observed on the video footage. The vehicle had a LPR captured at 1028 2023 at 2135 hours around 186th and Ocotillo Road, where it where, which is approximately 1.5 miles away from the residence where the video footage was recovered. An additional LPR captured the vehicle on 1028 at approximately 2201 hours around 196th and Ocotillo Road, which is less than 1.5 miles away from the residence where the footage was recovered from. Additionally, video surveillance recovered from Mansell o Carter Oasis Park, uh, Oasis Park, 19535 East Appleby Road, 
Queens Creek. It should be noted 196.3 gives access to Mansell Carter Park from Ocotillo. Video surveillance from Mansell Carter Oasis Park shows a white SUV similar to the one registered to Billy Least is seen traveling north on Appleby and entered the south roundabout for the park at about 2202 hours. And based on the same information, a records check was conducted for a Nissan Frontiers registered to Mason Jostin. A license plate was located LPR. The vehicle had a capture on 1028, 2023 at approximately 2151 hours on Appleby eastbound and towards park LPR capture on 1028, 2023 at about 2200 hours on Queen Creek and power WB and on 1029 at about 107 hours at EB Williams field towards 202 Walmart. Mansell Carter video surveillance also shows a vehicle matching the description of the Nissan Frontier to arrive about 2152 hours and leaves around 2157 hours along with three vehicles that appear to follow. Conclusion. Based on all of the above information, the following is believed to contain evidence related to the death investigation of um, Preston Lord. Based on my experience and all information we have specific to this investigation that juveniles often communicate via cell phone and social media platforms, it is also known that due to the media coverage and the citizens sharing tips, it is reasonable to believe that someone and Jacob have had conversations using their cell phone regarding this incident. Information that Talon contacted his stepbrother Brigham and Lori via cell phone Information that a Snapchat group existed with all of the individuals to include Mason Jostin. Information that Tristan Billy was inside the white BMW after the incident. And based on the above information, search warrants were requested as follows for Talon Renner, for photographs of Talon Renner, for any trace evidence, including but not limited to blood, body fluids, and tissue, hair, fibers, DNA, buckle swabs, and her fingerprints. And for Talon Renner's Verizon cell phone. Talon Renner's residence, Talon Renner's Verizon cell phone, his blue suit jacket, his white shirt, his black pants, his white shoes, and any and all electronic devices and any devices associated with any residential video surveillance footage. During the search warrant of Talon Renner's residence, it was learned the video surveillance system was accessed through Rebecca Renner's Talon's mother's cell phone while on scene a search warrant request physical seizure of her cell phone was applied for and granted rebecca renner it should be noted due to not being familiar with the e-warrant system rebecca renner is listed as the person who committed the crime which is incorrect the clerical error was not discovered until the search warrant was returned the person who committed the crime should have read talon renner jacob meisner Jacob's cell phone, Jacob Jake Meisner, photographs and any trace evidence, including blood, body fluids, not limited to them. Then Jacob Meisner's residence for the top hat with the feather, the gold, purple coat, cloak, bluish pants, electronic devices, and Jacob Jake Meisner's DNA. William Owen Hines and residence, a red cloak, a black long sleeve, black khaki pants, his phone, any trace evidence and photographs. A white uh, BMW bearing Arizona license plates, any biological specimens to include but not limited to blood tissue, hair, fingerprints, all electronic devices for video surveillance, cell phones, a black suit with vertical stripes and the Mason Jostin, cell phone belonging to Mason Jostin and photographs uh, due to the severity of the crime and intelligence regarding the above listed subjects, criminal history, as well as the criminal history of people associated at the addresses, the assistance from the SWAT was requested. Intelligence surrounding each subject was provided. Due to the subjects also being juveniles and possibly attending school during the time of the warrant service, QCPD detectives were simultaneously sent to the corresponding school to make contact with the juvenile. C supplements. Okay, below is a summary of the search warrants executed 
and what items were located. Talon Renner, Detective D. Iribi, and Worsko made contact at school, obtained photographs, buckles, and a cell phone. Talon Renner's residence, the SWAT arrived on scene, was in place at 12.50 hours. I made telephone contact with Rebecca Renner, who was out for a walk. She cooperated and met me at the scene. I read her the search warrant and provided her with a copy. It was later learned that she accessed her Nest camera with her Apple cell phone in the pink case. I applied for and was granted, uh, which granted the seizure of her cell phone. I seized her cell phone and entered it into evidence. I did a walk through the residence and left the scene to the next search warrant location. See supplements. Okay. So this goes on and on and on right now. How, mu how much did we read here? I don't know. Well, how long have we been on? We have been on an hour and a half almost. QCPD, uh, the William Owen Hines residence, that they made contact with William Owens, who was inside. William met them. Did, let's see, I explained the search warrant. We already got this. William's initial statement. I explained to William he was not under arrest, and if he wanted to provide information on the investigation, he could. The following is paraphrased. William said he hadn't spoken to his probation officer about this incident and wanted to talk to us. William was his friend and Alex Tenney. He had made mention that someone and Alex Tenney were good people and I did not have to respond to their house similarly to his house. William said they went to the first party via, del, via de Arboles and they were only there for 15 minutes. At the second party of one uh, 94th Street, they arrived and walked to the back. They were at that party for about 25 minutes. While in the backyard, he sees a large huddle, but he doesn't know what it was about. He described two black kids were drawn to each other. One of the black kids walks out and the other one stays back. William describes a Mexican kid he doesn't know was standing over another Mexican kid he didn't know. The kid that was standing over the one kid was saying, why the F are you recording? William describes the kid standing over him as a blonde wearing a darker color shirt. Then the group starts talking to the other kids that were involved. The kids start walking out and everybody and everyone William was with went out and with them the group of kids believed to be someone's group. William walks out also. About halfway down the street someone grabs someone's chain. William says the kid that was recording was the one that got his chain ripped off his neck. William described this subject wearing a black hoodie. William described a black male with a black ski mask as the one that took the chain, and then someone swung on someone, possibly the Mexican kid he was talking about earlier. William said a subject comes from the right side and smacks a kid, but he didn't know which kid got him. The whole group starts running, and William saw that kid fall. William said four to five sub. William saw four to five subjects on top of him. William said the black male in the black ski mask was kicking on him. William said he saw it all go down. William said one of the kids that was on top of him, someone going at it with Talon. When William is saying going at it, he means he's making punching motions. He says Talon was punching someone along with other people. William also saw a couple of kicks being thrown. William said he wasn't sure if he saw Treston. William also describes Jake Meisner as wearing a purple hat and a purple coat. After that, everybody just left. William left and his friend in a white Honda. William was hesitant to provide and Alex's information. William said he was in fear of his own life and was concerned about, his body, about my body-worn camera. I explained to him the report in the body-worn camera can be redacted due to juveniles being involved. According to William, someone saw the incident too, but was still talking to his mother about coming forward. I ended my contact with him and I did a quick walk through the residence and handed the scene over to Detective Shipman and I then responded to Jacob Jake Meisner's residence. Okay, so I think we're going to end it there for right now. Um, we may continue with more of this tonight. Um, I don't know. I was going to do some crafts tonight. I don't know if I am at this point. I've got to make Ethan's birthday cake, so I may come up when I'm doing that. I don't know. 
I have to see. I may do that. I may come on and what I'm doing is birthday cake on just do the live on my phone on the, on what I'm doing that because I have to start that. All right. And uh, where were the adults? Oh, Debbie L. This is horrific. This is a horrific case. You've got to go back and listen to this. It's so bad. It's so bad. So bad. I wish uh, more people would like get involved with this because it's terrible. All right. I uh, love you guys. God bless. And I'll see you later. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you later. And if you have missed this, there's like a playlist for this. And there's like seven other parts of this. So you can listen to that if you want to. I'll talk to you guys later. Love you guys. Bye. Take it easy.